What's going on everybody? This is Cody, the home theater hobbyist. As many of you know, I am a fan of physical media, 4K USD disc, Blu-rays, that type of thing. Over the past decade, decade and a half, maybe even two decades, streaming movies online has definitely become a thing. I mean, I think we all watch movies online from time to time, whether it be Netflix, HBO Max, whatever it is, we definitely watch them. But that being the case, there has become a narrative that streaming, or excuse me, physical media is dead or dying. And I personally don't believe that. But I decided to interview, or at least request an interview, with a company on the other side, that being a distributor of 4K USD disc. So in this video, I interview Arrow Video or Arrow Films about their 4K UHD disc business, how it's going, you know, the Blu-ray business, they give us a behind the scenes look in, you know, sort of what they do, which is really, really nice. We touch on the cost of 4K, we touch on, like I said, uh, the state of physical media and where they think it's going, also region encoding and many other things. So check out those chapter markers down below. You can find the section that you're most interested in, but honestly, I suggest you just watch the whole thing through because it is a very, very good discussion and it gives you a nice behind the scenes look. Also, check out those links below to find out more about Aero Films. So let's jump into the interview. So let's go ahead and let's get started with the folks that I have here. Um, Kevin, Michael, you want to introduce yourselves? Sure. Hi, I'm Kevin Lambert. I'm the head of acquired content at Arrow, uh, and I basically head up our acquisitions department and um, help oversee things slightly in the production department as well. Um, and I am Michael McKenzie. I am uh, my well, my official title is senior producer, and essentially that means that I'm part of a team that is responsible for overseeing um, our physical media releases from basically from the kind of the sort of conception phase all the way to the you know the the physical discs actually ending up on store shelves so that's you know kind of designing well um you know um, commissioning um artwork booklet essays bonus features researching you know what goes onto the disc in terms of cuts soundtracks that sort of thing so basically it's kind of a you know, it's a, it's a kind of, you know, sort of all hands on deck, you know, doing a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can you tell us just a little bit about Aero Films and sort of what you do, how you guys get started? Sure. I mean, we're, um, we're a, a boutique independent company. Um, we've been in the distribution space for over 30 years now in, um, in various guises. Um, Arrow Video um, as a brand and Arrow Academy have been more recent um, developments. I think Arrow Video was um, around 12 years, 13 years ago now, maybe. Um, and Arrow Academy a little bit after that. Um, and we distribute in both the UK and the US on physical disc, uh, as well as you know, theatrically and through, through VOD platforms as well. Um, the catalog is very wide ranging. We like to cover a lot of, uh, a lot of genres and a lot of types of film, new and old. Um, but our main our main focus is on uh, on the world of cult cinema and and classic uh, masterpieces. Okay, yeah, yeah. So personally, I've heard about Arrow Films before, but I really kind of dug into it over the past uh, couple of months because you guys released one of my favorite movies, and that is uh, Tremors on 4K UHD. And um, the original Tremors is like my favorite and I ended up buying like a box set a few years ago. And so I've got a few of the other movies as well. I've actually bought all of them at this point. Um, but uh, when I found out it was coming out on 4K UHD, I was like, oh man, I got to get it. And um, and then I kind of waited around. It's like, oh, I'll pick it up at some point. And some re for some reason, I realized that it was a limited edition. And I was like, oh no, let me look into this. And so that's really when I kind of started looking into Arrow Films and saying, oh, you know, what are they about? And I was like, oh man, I got to buy this. So I went ahead and I picked it up and uh, I really like it. Um, I've watched it and there's a lot of bonus features on this. And so, uh, so one of the things I want to talk about is what you guys put into your releases. Um, how do you decide what you're going to put into your releases, uh, whether it be a limited edition or, you know, just your standard releases? I mean, even our, even our standard releases are, are, are pretty packed, but the, uh, mm -hmm. like the limited edition sort of tremors that you hold there, we do release quite a few, quite a few films in that kind of format, which is the more deluxe, the very bespoke, real collector sort of uh, editions. Um, we will follow on with a standard edition, but you know, as you can see what you have in your hand, it's got that, that hard, that hard box and it's got the book and uh you know the poster and the lobby cards and 
uh, a cheeky uh, Walter Chang's um, yeah. discount voucher in the <laughs> Yeah. Um, but as to, you know, sort of what goes into the disc and how we, um, you know, how we curate, curate that, Michael would maybe be better to speak, uh, speak than me on that, situ- that part. Yeah, I mean, I think... I think to a large extent it depends on two things and one of those is you know how how well we think it's going to sell you know obviously like like we try and make every every arrow release we we put out we try and make it special but there are you know there are special editions and then there are special editions yeah. and this is very much a you know an example of the latter I mean you know tremors you know just to kind of stick with this example you know tremors is a kind of extremely successful extremely popular you know cult film and put out by a you know major distributor universal so it's got it's got a large following so you know when we put out something like this we can be fairly confident that you know it's going to sell so that kind of justifies you know pushing the boat out in terms of well you know in terms of you know the bonus content that's on the disc in terms mm-hmm. of all the goodies that we we jam into the box mm-hmm. but then also in terms of you know spending the money to restore the film and get it looking as good as it possibly can i mean tremors is a particularly good example here i think because the previous blue blu-ray release of tremors was from I can't remember when it was maybe kind of 10 15 years old but it was a not a great looking disc all things considered and i mean i've seen some people um you know on on the kind of various forums you know facebook groups and and so on saying that as far as you know kind of a blu-ray to an ultra hd upgrade goes tremors is the cream of the crop it's the best you know it's it's the biggest upgrade that has been released to date and um yeah i i I would i would be inclined to agree with that i think i mean partly because um you know, as I said, the previous releases didn't look that amazing, mm-hmm. but also because you know just just what the four you know the ultra HD um, format allows you to do, um, you know the film looks, I would hazard a guess and say looks infinitely better than it's ever looked, you know, yeah. on, on in in theaters or you know in any other kind of sort of home video format, you know. Yeah. So, do you guys do that restoration process in house or? Absolutely, yeah. Um, we've got our own team internally, um, headed up by uh, a guy called James White, who's been with us for, for many years now. Um, mm-hmm. So we'll, you know, we'll communicate with the studios um, or independent rights holder, just dependent on, on where the film is, is coming from. And um, the whole process is, is managed by us internally. So even from scanning the negatives all the way through the restoration process, the grading, um, the QC, which is quite a uh, quite an in-depth process and something that Michael was very heavily involved with in our 4Ks because not the whole the whole team aren't aren't 4K compatible, so a lot of that falls mm-hmm. on Michael's shoulders. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and yeah, it's it's a completely internally managed process. We use ex- a few external laboratories to do the actual work, but um, mm-hmm. it's all it, it's all us basically. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of curious about a little bit about that, that 4K uh, quality control part of it. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, I mean, it's possibly it's possibly not as exciting as it sounds. What is essentially, <laughs> well, or maybe, maybe it is actually, maybe it is. It yeah. depends, depend, I would guess it probably depends on the film and depends on how, um, how much stomach you have for watching the same film over and over again. But yeah. essentially it's, you know, we're, it's watching the film, going th- you know, with a, you know, kind of going through it with a fine tooth comb, looking for any kind of errors in terms of you know possibly like issues with the color grading, or perhaps there's like maybe a flash frame has got in there, or mm-hmm. you know something you know some aspect of the framing is off, and basically then kind of delivering a report on that. It then mm-hmm. you know, goes back, fixes are made, it comes back again. You watch it again over and over and over. Um, repeat ad nauseum for you know multiple soundtracks, multiple subtitle tracks, you know, multiple different versions of the film. So it's a uh, you know it's it's a kind of it's a fairly it's, it's an intensive process, but it's you know it's a hundred percent necessary to make sure that you know what what ends up what you know in you know customers' hands is you know the, good. as as good as it can possibly be. And a real. I, um... Sorry to talk there, Michael. I think a real um, point that to, to back that up is maybe like demons. You know, I mean, how many how many different versions was was that? I think that was 
six was it yeah demons was a demons was a fun one a, a, a very interesting one you know these are two kind of classic italian horror movies from the mid 80s um very beloved arrow had released them before on blu-ray in fact i think they were among arrow's first blu-ray titles possibly about you know, 10 11 12 years ago and you know we kind of thought it was high time to revisit them do them in 4k do an all singing all dancing special release um i mean the first demons in particular is really interesting because in addition to there being you know italian and english soundtracks there are actually two english soundtracks so there's the international version mm -hmm. and then there's the american version which um, replaces some of the voices and has some different music cues and sound effects so you know when we when we knew we were going to do this, we knew we had to include both versions of the film. So that you know involved sourcing um, you know um, audio elements for the American version, and then also um, conforming our new restoration to the American cut, which is very very slightly different. There are a few um, scenes where there's a gang of punks joyriding, and they're using a Coca Cola can as um as a as a you know to to they're 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 sniffing coke from a coke can okay <laughs> two, different, two different kinds of coke but yeah. um presumably coca-cola wasn't too thrilled by that so for the u.s release they removed all the close-ups of the coke can um but you know so that so that means you know there's two slightly different cuts of the film in, in addition to the different soundtracks so these all have to be kind of um, synced up, conformed, and I mean that's one of the things that I'm able to do. I, I, I do a little bit of editing, but um, I, you know, when it when it comes to one of my titles that has different versions, I quite like from you know because it gives me a certain level of control over. It, I quite like to do that bit myself mm -hmm. instead of you know kind of delegating it to a third party. And it's um, it's it requires a kind of intimate knowledge of the film to make sure that you are actually you know what you were putting on the disc is a is an authentic recreation of you know an ex a, a, the, the original cut of the film and not just something that you've kind of invented for yourself okay, okay so well what equipment do you have uh, are, are you using to actually do your quality control are you do you have an oled tv you know your sound system what's behind me there okay um, yeah I've got an OLED TV, um, Ultra HD player, um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know a 5.1 um, speaker setup. Um, mm -hmm. It's nothing that's out of the, you know, out of the, you know, the grips of. You know, it's, it's not specialist equipment in, okay. in yeah. any sense because, because I mean the. The, I mean, the, the hardware that you can buy nowadays, the consumer level hardware is, is amazing. I mean, I've, I'm a huge, huge fan of OLED um, as a, you know, uh, TVs and I'm, I'm mm -hmm. firmly of the opinion that once you've seen one, it's really difficult to go back to anything else because you just, you get that really, really bright, vivid, pin sharp image with you know, these super, super deep, you know, kind of blacks and sort of blazing white so you know it's you're, you're getting this extremely vivid presentation that um well i mean not only is it not only is it does it look more impressive than um than anything else on the market it also makes it very easy to see any flaws so that's actually an advantage from a from a qc uh, standpoint okay okay so do you ever compare uh let's say the original negatives to what you guys have produced and see you know how much it pops more or anything like that is there anything like that in the process i think that's all kind of done in the um the dolby vision grade isn't it um, yeah yeah i mean that's i would say that kind of happens before either of us would get involved that would be mm -hmm. that would be what james white and his team would do and then you know we would receive what we receive is um, well initially we receive like a prores file of the of the restoration and then you know further down the line once we've got to the the authoring stage the disc authoring stage we'll receive a, a disc image that um you know is in theory what the customer is going to see when they put the disc into their player but you know obviously there will be kind of multiple passes to iron out any any errors and bugs and things like that during the uh the restoration stage itself obviously there 
the negative it's, itself is scanned and there could be issues there where we need to go back to a certain piece and have like another real rescanned if something's slightly off or there's some excessive wobble in the scanner. Um, and then the, all the way through, there's a lot of comparisons. We'll be comparing against multiple sources. So when we're restoring, we'll have, you know, DVD versions, Blu-ray versions from all around the world, because, you know, each, each release or depending on the, you know, the process of the creation of the master that was used for that, for that disc could have different color grades ever so slightly different framings. So we obviously need to look at those and then look historically and see if we can get a definitive answer of what is correct in inverted commas, if you want. Um, a lot of it's based on, on knowledge of a film of the era and, you know, what film stock was generally used or the production processes, um, a lot of Italian cinema uh, back in the day was all recorded, all the uh, dialogue was recorded post the film. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having that in the back of your mind and knowing that and looking at a film and saying, hey, that audio looks out of sync. And it's like, that's fine. That's, that's actually how it's meant to be because those actors never spoke those lines of dialogue. Or they were never recorded. Um, those time. lines of dialogue in situ. So, mm. um lots yeah. of comparison on different things yeah yeah you you get if you if you spend any time with these films and you know you're kind of looking for you know kind of synchronization errors you become quite adept at basically ignoring the dialogue like the lip movements and paying more attention to you know the you know the the, the, the does the when the when the knife go, when the knife goes into the into the person's eyeball does the does the sound <laughs> effect um you know sing, uh, match up with the with the visuals okay so speaking about the audio part because that's kind of the next part i want to talk about how do you guys um for like tremors for instance and i'm just using it just because that's the latest example that i have um you know it was released theatrically in a 2.0 track and it was expanded out to a dolby 5.1 you know how do you guys do just the expansion not specifically tremors but in general like whenever you expand out audio how does that work and well, or do you do that Let's talk about that. Some, sometimes, sometimes. I mean, we have a. I mean, our kind of philosophy is that the um, what what you what what you get in, on our discs should be as close as possible to you know what the filmmakers intended. So, mm -hmm. generally speaking, we don't go out of our way to do you know kind of we're not going to turn our, a mono movie into a you know, five point one surround sound yeah. movie yeah. unless. Unless sometimes the um, sometimes the licensor already has an existing up mix, and mm. they offer that to us, in which case you know we're more than happy to include it as a kind of alternate viewing option. I think a good example is um, you know kind of returning to the sort of the Italian horror beat um, Dario Argento's Deep Red, which was um, originally mixed in mono for both its English and Italian version. But when we did our um, our kind of restored Blu-ray release a few years ago. Um, the distribute the, the licensor said, "Hey, we've got a 5.1 Italian track. Do you want that?" And it's like, "Well, yeah, absolutely, absolutely." Mm -hmm. I mean, the uh, the mono version is still the default viewing option, but the you know the 5.1 is there on the disc. And I mean, I'm I must I must confess, I'm not I'm not too familiar with um, what different audio options are on the Tremors disc. I think there's yeah, that's fine. possibly a 4.0 track. There is. There's so a two, a four, and a 5.1. Yeah, so I think the 4.0 would be the closest to the original theatrical mix. Mm -hmm. That's probably like a, a, a left, uh, right, and center, and then a single rear. So that's what that's essentially what Dolby Stereo, um, you know, kind of mixes in the you know in the 80s and and through to the 90s were. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the 5.1 is probably something that the distributor um, supplied us with. A, I'm possibly talking absolute nonsense, but that's that would be my my guess. Okay. Um, I believe so. Well, let's just say you have more authority on that than I do. So it sounds plausible <laughs> to me, right? <laughs> but yeah, yeah I mean, that's cool. I, mean, demon, I can talk about demons because you know that's you know that's one that I oversaw from beginning to end, and you know that mm -hmm. was a, that's a fairly recent one. Um, demons, the previous releases have all been either mono or two channel stereo. 
Mm -hmm. um, but Demons and Demons 2 were both mixed in four channel Dolby stereo. And um, you know, for our for these releases, we were able to access you know the original audio elements. So we did what is, I mean, it's presented on the disc as a 5.1 track, but it is actually a, a faithful reproduction of the of the four channel Dolby stereo. So it's it's that kind of um front, um left, right, and center, and then um dual mono in the in the rears. So, you know, what you're hearing when you get that is what people would have heard, heard in a Dolby stereo equipped theatre back in the day. So it's, you know, it's the most authentic film has ever sounded on, you know, on end home video format. So that's, you know, it's always fun. It's always, and, and, you know, kind of gratifying to be able to, you know, to, to give people something that they haven't had before, but which is, you know, more faithful to, you know, anything they've had before. Mm -hmm. That was um, a bit of a prime, another example of that was um, The Thing, wasn't it? Where we had that 4.0 mm -hmm. track, which had never been available on any home, home video release previously. Um, but because we were going back to all the original elements, we were able to, to grab those as well. And, and, you know, present the most, as Michael says, the most authentic experience of the era. Okay. Okay. So how do you guys for lack of a better word, determine what you're going to acquire. I mean, I think you touched on it a little bit earlier where you said something that's going to, you know, as far as how you separate out a limited edition versus a standard edition, but like, you know, you guys are into cult film, sci-fi, that sort of thing. How do you say, okay, this is the list. This is what we're going to try to hit, you know, in 2021. Is there like a selection process? What do you do? Um, th there is a selection process. We work very collaborative, co collaboratively as a team. Um, I suppose the easiest answer here is it's stuff that we want to see on Blu-ray <laughs> or UHD. <laughs> nice. um, there's, there's multiple ways, you know, a title can come around um, and we've all got our own um, unique sort of speciality areas of, of cinema. Um, but we're all just, you know, we're all just film nerds and mm -hmm. we're like, we want to, we want to see something. We want to get it released. Um, so it, it might come from, uh, you know, a member of the team sort of saying, oh, you know, I dug out this old VHS of X at the weekend and it was absolutely great. Like, does anyone know what's happening with it? Mm -hmm. And then we'll, we'll sort of go away and re research the rights and speak to, you know, speak to who we think might have it, might own it. Mm -hmm. um, another way things come about is um, we've got great relationships with lots and lots of producers rights holders and major studios so they will just send us lists they'll be like we've got all of these titles available for the territories that you guys work in is there anything you want is there anything you want to work on um, our fan base are quite rabid as well so we get a lot of suggestions mm -hmm. um we've got a, an email address dedicated purely to suggestions so that we don't get bombarded um yeah. so we'll go through that you know and you can see it every month when we we announce our titles. You know, people bringing up the same the same title over and over and over. So it's like we're not ignoring them. We're just you know we're trying to find them. Maybe maybe we're working on them. Maybe they're in rights limbo. But um, yeah, there's lots of ways. Um, and then yeah, we'll we'll bounce the ideas around internally. So we'll come up with, I mean, Tremors for example. We've got great you know a great relationship with Universal. So. Um, we normally do sort of like packages with them where we'll take 10 or, or five films in, in sort of a go. Mm. Um, and we'll, you know, sit down, discuss those, discuss the opportunities for them, look at the current releases, um, or maybe watch them if we haven't seen them or we're not incredibly familiar with them. And um, just work out what hasn't, hasn't worked before. So... You know, as Michael pointed out, the previous Tremors disc was the picture quality wasn't great. The audio, I think it just had the 5.1. I don't think it even had the stereo mix on there. So you left for your equipment to down mix the 5.1. Um, not any extras to mention. There might have been a few little bits. So it's, it's an obvious sort of gap in the market. We're like, okay, does it tick boxes? A, is it an amazing cult film? Yes. B, is the previous release lacking? Yes. Do we have a relationship with the people that own it? Yes. 
does it work financially on paper? I mean, that's obviously, you know, we are your a business at the end yeah, of the day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so then, you know, I'll go away, I'll do a lot of analysis and, like, you know, sort of profit and forecasting and then, and then sort of the thumb bit essentially starts, you know, we'll sit there and, and talk about you know, who we can interview, who's available, who might still be alive. You know, one of the unfortunate things of releasing films from the eras that we do is, you know, we're sadly starting to lose cast and crew from those, um, those productions. Um, and then we sort of, you know, we set budgets, we decide on, you know, restorations and, and then, yeah, that's sort of Michael and, and the other producers go away and, um, and make it all happen basically. Oh, well, so it, how long is this process? Is it five years? Is it one year? You know, just how long is a piece of string? <laughs> 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 I mean, some of them, some of them are, um, some of them are, do take years. Uh, I mean, a, a kind of classic example of that, um, that, um, that I worked on recently was Southland Tales. Um, yeah. Richard Kelly film. I mean, it was a it was a project that was long in the gestation. Um, I mean, I think, I think, and I, th I think essentially the kind of natural turnover was such that I was something like the third producer that was assigned to it because people kept jumping ship. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe it was something about Southland Tales. I don't know. But um, when I when I took the reins, essentially, you know, although it had been kind of making its way through slowly through the pipeline, you know, the, the restoration was being done. You know, um, um, we involved director Richard Kelly and he and the and the cinematographer Stephen Poster, and they, you know, kind of um, um, gave their notes on the grading, and made, we made tweaks and um, sent it back to them for approval, and so on and so forth. But um, yeah, I think it had been. I mean, I think it had been. You know, we'd had it. We'd had the rights for three or four years before you know, kind of. I I ended up you know kind of taking it on, and at that point, you know, it was a case of you know it kind of sort of finally went into you know kind of full scale production in terms of you know getting artwork done for the packaging, um, commissioning essays for the booklet, and then um, you know kind of commissioning um, you know the bonus features for the disc. But that was that. I mean, that's a kind of unusually long one. I mean, I mean, I've also had cases where, um, you know, I I kind of either inherited a project that someone else has been involved with, or it's been a kind of very kind of quick sort of smaller project. Maybe you know, maybe one that's um, you know, it's just going to be a standard edition with maybe a couple of new extras. I mean, those can get turned around in a couple of months. Um, I mean, I would say that's probably the except. Th those are both sort of extreme examples. They're, they're kind of the exceptions rather than the rule. But um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think, you know, kind of, I mean, Kev, you can maybe um, agree or disagree in this, but I think sort of six months is kind of standard. Yeah, six months feels, feels about, about normal. You know, I mean, from, from, the, from the point of just trying to think about our, our timelines, um, in my head but from the point of acquisition to the release date i think our timelines run like a year is it I can't, or is it 13 months i can't remember the exact dates off the top of my head but um that seems to ring about um and then obviously the the acquisition part of that in the background you've probably got another another sort of three months of time there where you know you're negotiating or or working out specific deal terms or waiting for rights holders to reply that sometimes they only own say like half of the film so they need to talk to another producer to be able to uh you know to broker the broker the deal um mm. but but from from an idea hitting a piece of paper in the office to release it's probably about a year and a half maybe maybe a little bit longer if it was you know all run month by month by month um otherwise i mean there are things that you know as michael mentioned with south and Towers, which was on the books for for a good three years before it released um you know it it was acquired and it just sat there in the background while we released other things in between maybe ones that we had we already had in like in stock as it were or new ones that come through that were just more exciting propositions at the time you know maybe there's an anniversary that is coming up 
that we need to sort of tie a release into. Um, or, um, you know, we, we do release new films as well. So with releasing new films, they're a little bit more time um, sensitive because um, you have exposure coming from things like, you know, festivals. And if a film was in sort of like Sundance or Toronto, um, there's that buzz around it. You know, if you let that buzz die off too, too much, then you've, you've got to start doing all the work again. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's um, I'd, I'd say about a year and a half from from idea to to disc in hand. Okay, okay. So and then, like we said earlier, um, depending on how familiar people are with it and things like that, you'll decide if you want to do, let's say, a standard version and also do a limited edition version. And I guess that also uh, you'd also think about you know, if you can do some of the cast interviews or director interviews and stuff like that as well for the limited edition, if you want to do that. And that kind of all ties into whether a limited edition is quote unquote worth it, I guess. Yeah, I mean, kind of kind of uh, calling back to what uh, something uh, Kev said earlier about, you know, the kind of the vintage of some of these films, the reality is that, you know, the people that were involved in them are not going to be around forever. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I can't tell you what the title is, but it's, um, there's a box set of kind of genre films that I'm working on at the moment that should be announced this month, you know, later this month. And, you know, it's going to be a kind of all singing, all dancing box set with, you know, new restorations for the films, but also a kind of plethora of cast and crew interviews. And I mean, one of the reasons for that, that we're pushing the boat out a little bit more with, with this is that we are conscious of the fact that, you know, given given the, the vintage of the films and the age of the, you know, the, the people involved, this could be the last time that a lot of them will sit down in front of a camera and talk about them. So, you know, it's, it's, it's vitally important that, you know, you know, for, you know, for, you know, for sort of, um, for prosperity's sake that we, you know, kind of, that we, that we capture their thoughts and their, their memories of, you know, having, you know, you know, having made these films and it, you know, kind of, we, you know, we need to do them justice and you know that 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 you know justifies spending a bit of extra money to you know kind of do this properly yeah yeah so what the other thing that i learned was that uh it looks like from the research i did on your website that you really kind of started releasing 4k films in the 2019 2020 time frame um are you happy with what you've seen so far is that you know i, I i'm excited about that as a you know as a home theater enthusiast right but um how's that going it's good i mean we were quite we were quite slow coming into it um obviously with 4k both the remastering at, at full 4k with sort of hdr 10 and dolby vision grades adds an extra cost factor to the you know to the back end of bringing the product to market um, the discs themselves are drastically more expensive than a Blu-ray disc, um, and um, the um, the market. We weren't sort of like the first in of this sort of independence, uh, you know, of, of our kind of level. I mean, Studio Canal in the UK had a few before us uh, of the same, you know, similar type of films. Uh, and a couple of a couple of labels in the US as well. Um, so we came into it a, a little bit sort of slowly and a little bit cautiously and sort of picked our battles. Um, so I think our first one was uh, Flash Gordon, um, sure. which we did in in the states, um, and very shortly after that, if not at the same time, um, Pitch Black. Um, again, that was that was in the UK and the US. Um, so, obviously, they're titles of a certain level that we were relatively confident that they would they would work and they would do well, um, and both have done very well. And it's 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 good to see that people were engaged in them, um, and um, and and the uptake of them as well. The sort of the comparison, the difference between Blu-ray and the 4K UHD version. There is a definite leaning towards the 4K version, which is very encouraging to a format, with it being quite a new format and not quite a bigger jump as you know, say DVD to Blu-ray was, um, or or VHS to DVD even, um, which was obviously huge. Um, 
so yeah, so they've been going well. Um, we've got a, we've got a solid lineup coming up over the next year. Um, we're doing, um, I think, at the moment since the first one, we're about one a month. Um, but that schedule that schedule does ramp up over the rest of this year and into next. We're sort of getting into two, sometimes possibly three uh, new UHDs a month. Um, I like that. But, I like um, that. But yeah, I mean, at, at the moment, we're sort of, they're all of a level where we we think that, you know, the films of that, um, you know, Flash Gordon, Old Boy, Pitch Black, Tremors, you know, th those bigger properties, which should have a wider audience, should resonate well to both sort of audiences. I always kind of think of the consumer being, there being two different types of consumer. There's the the home entertainment collector, you know, home theatre enthusiast who mm -hmm. is an early uptaker on the equipment, is you know willing to sort of buy that limited edition set because they want the you know the ephemera that comes with it or mm -hmm. the the writing that comes with it. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's also the um, more casual consumer who you know would maybe pick up. Um, tremors in Best Buy, um, just from casually browsing the shelves, being like, "Oh, cool, Tremors," but I'm not going to pay. I'm not going to pay the higher price point for that deluxe version. So we have the more standard version made available as well. Um, they do. They do normally follow post the the, stand, the special edition because you know we like to to give the best edition. It's it's best like first. But right. um, so yeah, so. They're all they're all going well, and then that'll allow us to start getting into some more obscure stuff um, once we've built up built up a bit of a sort of a catalogue of UHD. Mm -hmm. We can start delving a bit deeper, and um, to some extent, I mean, we've already started doing that with the um, with the Argento that we we announced recently, even though it is a, a, a Canon Jello. Okay. okay. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the kind of you know the sort of the independent you know the boutique labels jumping into a new format you saw the same with blu-ray where you know initially a lot of the labels were kind of a bit you know kind of reluctant to you know kind of move on from dvd to blu-ray is this going to like is this is this just going to be a fad is this 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 does this form going to have any longevity is it worth the money are people going to want to buy you know releases of films that they've already bought on dvd but then all it really takes is um you know one label to um, dip their toes in the water and then it's kind of almost like the dam bursting everyone else then kind of follows on and i i mean i think i think to some, possibly not to quite the same extent um with ultra hd because as you know as kev said it's, it's not quite as you know it's not quite as night and day a difference, you know, from going from Blu-ray to Ultra HD as it was going from DVD to Blu-ray or Blu from VHS yeah. to DVD. But I still, I mean, I, I would still imagine that we'll, you know, we'll see more of the kind of the independent labels start to, you know, kind of um, certainly test the waters, you know, now that, you know, the likes of Arrow have done it, you know, and Kino in the, in the US has done a couple and, you know, Studio Canal has you know, been doing it in a big way. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, I think the other thing that you're, you don't have to worry about is the fact that, you know, when Blu-ray came out, there was also the HD DVD war, you know, people trying to pick a side, you know, well, that kind of thing. Yeah, and so we don't have I, that to worry about this time, which is I, I have my war stories from that because I, I backed the losing horse. <laughs> oh, I, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I was one of the earliest adopters for HD DVD. Uh -huh. uh, you know, for six months or so, it was great. And then the PlayStation 3 came out with Blu-ray playback and it was all over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I still have a pile of HD DVDs that I can't shift. <laughs> I think that's one of the great things for the 4K UHD format as well is, you know, the latest generation of consoles having 4K UHD players. It's going to put 4K UHD Into our homes. playback capability in a lot of homes that... Mm -hmm that might not necessarily go out and buy a 4K player for UHD discs. Mm -hmm. bit, you know, oh no, happy with Blu-ray looks fine. It upscales perfectly well for my TV. You know, some people could be of that opinion, but then, you know, they get a PlayStation 5, they've got 4K playability, they get a disc in a bundle where they buy, you know, the, the console, a, a game and a, a UHD, and then 
they're like wow this is like this is better so is better. um which is again like michael said the hd dvd versus blu-ray war uh split uh, the playstation 3 kind of won that for the format yeah and, yeah. and the porn industry back in blu-ray which is just <laughs> yeah yeah so i want to go back for just a second um and you guys don't have to comment specifically on this, but I just kind of want to put it out there because you guys mentioned it. And uh, one of the issues that some people say with 4K UHD uptake is price, right? It costs more than Blu-ray and Blu-ray is good enough. But one of the things that you mentioned, I just want to say this specifically is you mentioned that the disc actually costs you guys more as well. Um, and so, you know, for those people that are like, oh, price, uh, price is, well, it, the disc itself is more expensive. And so, they are going to have, they are business they have to charge for it. So I just kind of want to mention that really quickly um, because I think that it's is a, just, an important um, point. It's, it's not just the actual disc, you know, that mm -hmm. every, every part of the process uh, to bring a UHD to market is more expensive than it is to bring a Blu-ray to market. I mean, to, to bring a, a, a 2K restoration um, to market on, on a Blu-ray, um, and to bring a 4K HDR um, UHD 100 disc to market, um, those those background costs are like triple what the Blu-ray is. So it's like we do appreciate. Yep, they're a little bit more. They're a little bit more expensive, but um, but yeah, our our cost of time is three. Yeah. Wow. I mean, also, um, it, it's also you know, in you know, kind of manners as well, because you know, when, when you're you know, when you're talking about actually encoding the feature that's going to go on the disc, you know, the kind of the compression process that sort of smashes down, you know, a, a, a file that's you know, kind of multiple terabytes in size and down into something that fits on a 100 gigabyte disc, but still, you know, kind of maintains all that quality. That takes days. You know, whereas with with a Blu-ray, it would be you know it's, you're talking hours, if that. But um, you know, oh. just the um, the amount of computing power that's required, the amount of time that it takes to do these things, everything you know, kind of everything shoots up by factors of you know, at least three, possibly more than that. Yeah. So it's uh, I, I mean, I, I actually do think I mean, I, I I absolutely hear you that you know they they do cost a little bit more, but um, I actually think compared with you know what's actually going in the cost at the other end to the consumer is it's actually i don't think it's really that bad it's a few dollars more here and there i think so i think right. it's, I, I mean i personally as a, as a customer myself and someone that you know now that i you know now that i have the, the capability to play ultra hd will always choose the ultra hd version of a release if if it's available i i definitely think it's worth it personally yeah, yeah. And I feel the same. I mean, you know, I might not go out and rebuy all of my old stuff again, no. you know, necessarily unless I really like it. But, um, but I definitely if I can buy it in 4k, and it's, you know, new to me, I'm going to buy it in 4k. Yeah. Um, and I, honestly, I had no idea that it could be as much as 3x the cost over the entire pipeline. Because again, like you said, typically, it's only a couple, a few, you know, five, maybe $10 more uh, between yeah. the Blu ray and a 4k UHD. Um, so that's actually a really good data point. And honestly, this right here is probably worth the price of admission because a lot of people in my videos have said, oh, well, you know, I, I, 4k is just, it's not worth the cost. It's not worth the cost. That's kind of a, a big thing. And it's just like, uh, I mean, you can find them on sale during Christmas, you know, like all of those things and, yeah. um, and it becomes more accessible. So I mean, I also, have, sorry, Michael, you go. Yeah, I was just going to say when when Blu-ray came along, it pushed the prices of D the cost of the prices of DVDs down. So mm -hmm. I, I mean, I've, I've not, I must admit, I've not really paid too much attention to whether you know history is repeating itself there. But you know, I wouldn't be surprised if you know the the availability of Ultra HD releases has an impact on the cost of Blu-ray releases. Yeah, and on the other side of that as well, the production side of that, the, the these costs were evident as well when Blu-ray first hit the market, you know, the extra costs for authoring and manufacture was was a big consideration because it was massively more than DVD was because, you know, it's a format that's been around for a long time. So those costs I do see over time sort of coming down a little and as 
technology advances, you know, Michael was saying it takes days to, to compress the feature file for, for a film, you know, as technology and processing power and things advance, that time will come down. So therefore, you know, man hours, man hour sort of charging will, will hopefully be, be reduced. And you say, as you say, there's, there's always, you know, going to be sales as things get older in their, in their natural life, they're going to be, you know, like a Halloween sales or Christmas sales, or right now on our website, we've got an Easter carnage sale. So, yeah, yeah. you know, there's a couple of UHDs in there. I think King of New York's in there. Um, and uh, maybe Cinema Paradiso. Um, so it's like, you know, some of those first UHDs that we, we released are now at that stage in their life where, uh, where, they, where they get into, uh, getting to be on sale. Right, right. Um, and speaking, I just want to step back really quickly to your Blu-rays. Uh, do you do any region encodes for your Blu-rays or are they just region free? I mean, I know UHD is region free, right? So... Yeah, yeah, UHD is region free. Um, we essentially sometimes the licensor will request. Well, in fact, they'll 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 they'll, they'll demand it because mm -hmm. you know, perhaps they own the rights to the film in one territory but not the other. So so if if a US if a if a distributor has the US rights but not the European rights, for example, they may well say, well, you, 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 can, you can license this title from us, but you have to encode it so that it can't then be you know, imported by people in the, in the region where we don't have the rights. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, multi-region players are widely available, so there are always ways around it, but um, that, that is kind of the reality that, you know, that, that we have to deal with you know, in the industry. But as you say, not a problem at all for Ultra HD, which doesn't have any region coding. So another reason to buy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Situations as well where we may only have the rights in, in one particular territory. So um, even though we are a UK and a US distributor, um, sometimes it's just not possible to, to, to license something for the US. It may already be with um, another local company um, and the same for the UK. So in those situations, as Michael said, the, the licensor or the rights holder will normally say to us, you can you can release it, but you've got to be like region A if it's US only or region B if it's UK. Um, but nine times out of 10, if, if we're releasing it in both both territories, they're region free. Yeah, it's, it's the same exact disc, just in slightly different packaging. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's good to know. That is good to know. So um, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about physical media, the current state, and sort of where you see it going. Um, and if you want to talk, let's say, pre-COVID times and post-COVID times, if you guys have noticed a difference or, you know, anything like that, what do you think about physical media? Where is it going? Um, I mean, I, I suspect that with, you know, streaming services like Netflix and Amazon Prime and Disney Plus, um, I think, I mean, physical media is not going to go anywhere, you know, I, I, I would stake my you know, stake my life on that. It's 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 always going to be around, but I definitely do think it's going to become more of a you know, uh, an enthusiast's um, format, because I mean you're you know we we, we talked about um, you know kind of people that might just want to pick up a copy of the standard standard edition of Tremors in Walmart because it's not because they're necessarily you know, a film aficionado or, you know, um, you know, kind of, you know, sort of a, a tech junkie. They just, you know, they see it on the shelf. They like the look of it. That's the kind of the same audience I suspect that is going to sit down in front of Netflix and be like, well, let's see what's on, what's available. And we'll, we'll, we'll pick a film based on that. But I, but there, I mean, the, the kind of the collector's market is always going to be there for, um, you know, people that want, you know, not just the film itself, but, you know, kind of nice deluxe packaging, you know, mm -hmm. lots of bonus features, which is something that, you know, I mean, continues to surprise me that the likes of Netflix and Amazon don't offer any bonus features. Um, whereas, I mean, Arrow's got a streaming platform, the Arrow Player, but I mean, we do, um, we kind of look to kind of provide, you know, people with as, as much content as possible from the discs, but, um, at the end of the day, the discs themselves are still, you know, they will be the kind of the enthusiasts uh, preferred viewing option because you'll get better image quality, you'll get choice of soundtracks, you'll get audio commentaries, maybe multiple cuts of the film. So, I mean, I think it's, um, 
you know, th there will always be reasons why physical media is superior in terms of both quality and quantity. And I think that will continue, you know, to drive, you know, kind of the, the, the sort of, well, I mean, I mean, I was going to say the hardcore crowd, but it's not just the hardcore crowd. It's people that, you know, kind of appreciate getting that little bit extra for their money. I think mm -hmm. they, will, they will always kind of continue to look for, you know, physical media. And there's a very much with um, sort of streaming platforms. I kind of look at it a lot of the time as a like a try before you buy almost. So mm -hmm. you do have the you know you've got the option. You watch something on on a streaming platform, you enjoy it. You're like, oh yeah, that was really really good. It's still in your mind. You know, you're browsing Amazon, um, limited edition pops up or something pops up in your Facebook feed from a friend, and you're like. I really enjoyed that. I want to delve more into it. And oh, that just looks amazing. It's so, you know, there's a lot of that. But as Michael says, this is, I don't think it's going anywhere and like anytime soon at all. And the, the numbers, the, you know, the percentage of uh, 4K UHDs we're selling against a Blu-ray when we're releasing at the same time is extremely encouraging and it's extremely encouraging that the format has a, a larger what appears to be a larger uptake than we possibly you know than we possibly thought when we were first going into it so that's that's absolutely great and blu-ray and blu-ray and sort of uhd sales are, are relatively stable you know there's a lot of talk of sort of declining markets and and things like that but for collector's products and you know boutique expansive you know releases very curated releases mm -hmm. there does seem to be a pretty solid market for them um and you know your kind of um you know direct to video supermarket one week on that shelf and and that's that's the life of the dvd done um you know those films are, are disappearing very rapidly. You're, you're not seeing as many of those anymore. Um, and when you are, they're, they're kind of better quality than they were like four or five years ago when there was 10 new ones a, a week. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm as, as a company, we're totally behind it. We do embrace all of the technologies. As Michael said, you know, we, we launched our own, our own streaming service um, in the fall in the US and just in the spring in uh, over here in the UK. Yeah. Um, but that covers that it's basically curating a, a VOD service to be very much like a disc. So you'll have some extras on there, maybe commentaries. Um, and um, it's, it's a service that switches up as well. So you might see something there one month but it's not there the next so so that again will prompt people to go out and buy discs yeah i mean my my kind of take on it is that um you know netflix and um disney plus and arrow player they're not re they're not like a replacement for you know the criterion collection or you know kind of arrow video and arrow academy releases what they're a replacement for essentially is like blockbuster you know, it's a kind of you, you're you're paying up, so you're you're paying less money to get a product that you you're renting rather than owning, and you know you you I mean I I mean I think the likes of Netflix and you know, certainly Arrow, um, <clears throat> you get a great value for money because you get a huge amount of content, but it's not content that you own, and as as Kev said, the content is always changing. So you know, if you're relying on your favorite film being available on a streaming platform, you know, kind of a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, five years from now, you, you can't make those guarantees. So, I mean, the, I think from a, from a kind of the point of view of being a fan of films and wanting to own your own copy of the film that you can watch anytime, you know, the physical versions are always going to be there um, and they're always going to be the kind of the optimal choice. Whereas um, I think there's a slightly more, you know, the, you know, kind of deciding to sit down and watch a film on a streaming platform is, 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 is kind of a slightly more casual option, almost. I think as well, there's the, you know, the technological bit behind it where, you know, people like ourselves that do have 
larger OLED screens, 4K players, and the ability to stream 4K, you've still got to look at the technology of like, you, you know, your internet, your bandwidth. I mean, you can't stream as uncompressed uh, as you can on a, on a 4K UHD. You know, even sort of like 4K UHD Netflix and Amazon Prime, you know, they're, they're pretty heavily compressed. So if you do have a, a relatively reasonable, um, you know, relatively high-end setup, you're going to see those you're going to see those issues and you know pop in a uhd and they're not there yeah yeah and i mean i think um the bigger the screen you have you know the more you're going to see that as well um because you know a lot of people have you know true projection setups and 120 inches 150 inches okay. like you're going to notice those compression artifacts a little bit more yeah. um especially when streaming and obviously yeah you, you you can't watch a movie on netflix if you don't have any internet in your house Right. right. Your internet goes down. What, what are you going to watch? Yeah. Right. Right. And one of the things I think about as well is just the fact that, you know, streaming is going to catch that, you know, sort of fat center of content, but some of your extreme edges, you know, some of your older stuff or specialty type stuff, whether it be music or, or whatever, um, you're probably not going to find on the streaming service. So you're better off buying it, especially if you can buy it, you know, once and then watch it for years um, that way as well. So. Yeah, I, th I think that's very much like the situation, you know, the um, blockbuster analogy that Michael used. That's mm -hmm. like, you know, yes. I want to, I, I want to browse a bunch of stuff and find a film. Okay, that looks fine. That'll do. It's like, whereas you know, going into going into a, a, a either a bricks and mortar store and seeking out a specific item that you know you want is a very different, very different market. And I think that a lot of the people that, um, you know, that buy into our products, they're, you know, they're not just going to Amazon, clicking DVD and whatever's in that top rail, choosing one, you know, they're going to Amazon, they're typing in the exact title of the film they want, or they're typing in Arrow Video because they know that they want something from us or, mm -hmm. you know, and this isn't just limited to us, you've got, other labels who are doing great stuff as well, like Criterion and, and Shell Factory and Kino Lorber, to, to some extent, doing some of similar stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so they are people that are actively seeking it. And that's really, really exciting and encouraging that people are going out and being like, I want Tremors. And typing in Tremors, you know, a movie the age of it is. And, you know, the, uh, the, the age bracket of, of our consumers is is quite quite strange when you track it. You know, you have some people that are like, would have seen that in the cinema. And then you've got a lot of younger people, you know, just late teens being like, yep, yeah, uh, I want to see that. I've read so much about it. My dad talks about it, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's great. That's good. That's good. Um, it's especially that you have the, the younger demographic in there just because, I mean, again, they're, quote unquote the future right um yeah uh just and the, the, future, the future filmmakers as well you know the, You're right there's there's only this is something uh, we, we joke about quite a lot it's like there's only so many films made in the 80s like we can't just keep releasing <laughs> 80s classics because we're going to run out one day right um so you know you need to look to the younger generation that are coming through now and releasing you know releasing their first feature that's maybe they're going to make the next tremors in in five years um so we, you know, we embrace that as well, um, and uh, and we do release we do release newer stuff as well. Um, although we haven't done any UHDs yet, to the best of my memory, have we? I don't think so. No, no. Mm. Yeah, I think Old Boy is probably the newest thing, isn't it? Mm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, I know we got to wrap it up here, but I did, uh, I do have two quick questions. Do you guys want to expand at all on your uh, video on demand service or do you want to just leave that as it is? Do you have anything to say about that? Uh, expand as in wider reach or, or? Or just just talk about it in general. I mean, we've been focusing oh, okay. on the physical stuff, but yeah. you want to talk about um, video on demand? Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a curated platform. Um, as I say, it's, um, it's arrow-player.com. Uh, a shameless plug in there um it's it's kind of the way i i see it i'm not sure if uh our vod team planned it like this but i see it as like a whole bunch of film festivals 
all in one place. So, you know, if you wanted to go to an all night slashathon, there's normally a section that you can jump in and, you know, see those types of film. Uh, but then they're also supported by, um, by extras. And it, it makes it a little bit different from going on something like Netflix, where, you know, you're just limited to the film. We've, we've got extra, extras there, we've got other content. Um, we launch films exclusively on there sometimes before they hit physical media, um, which helps us helps us push it to a bit of a wider audience. Obviously, as we say, streaming platforms are quite cheap. Um, you know, you get a free trial. So if you're not um, if you're not 100 percent convinced about a certain title, you know, you can give it a go here and then come back to it and say, Oh, I watched that last month on the service. It's not on the service anymore, but now they've released the Blu-ray with all these extra extras. Um, and yeah, I mean, you can get the you, you can get the gist of the the kind of stuff that's on there. But stuff comes out, stuff goes in. Um, we run seasons with uh, with other companies, which is one of the great things that um, it, you know the physical world is one of those limitations sometimes where. A film is under license with another distributor obviously we want to release it but we can't do that so with um with the streaming service we've got the option to go to them and say hey we want to put your content on our service can we uh can we agree on that and you can see that there with with slaughterhouse that isn't actually a film that we've released but mm -hmm. we've, um, we've licensed that in okay Possibly also worth uh, pointing out that Arrow Player is the only streaming platform that um, has the seal of approval of Quentin Tarantino. Indeed, yes. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. I think the quote yeah, was... Um, he, was it um, Arrow Player is the only streaming platform for me or something like that? Yeah, it was, and he said, yeah, I, I don't... What's, I don't need to. I don't need to watch it all the time. I'm just happy to give them my money. I said something along those lines. <laughs> But yeah, that's the other thing um, with our sort of connections to filmmakers. We have um, have them kind of curate seasons. So um, we had Ed Edgar Wright curate a season uh, just recently, and um, we're talking to a another couple of filmmakers about doing stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so they can look through everything that we've currently got on there, not got on there, currently have um, coming in from other you know other distributors. And they can put together a season, and you know, that help help spread the word on it. Okay, cool, cool. But yeah, I don't think it's it's never going to it's never going to replace physical. It's just it's, we we see it as a very much as a side by side approach, and there's different audiences for for different formats. You know, people might have very small you know very small houses and don't have room for. A whole bunch of uh, Blu-rays, but they've got a pretty wide selection of stuff they know they're probably going to like on the service. Sweet. All right. Well, good. I, I wasn't, I wasn't totally aware of this, but I am happy to see that you guys have it. Um, and you know, like you said, just have other options for people that may, like you said, maybe space constrained or or whatever. They just you know just want to check out a film. They don't necessarily want to buy it, but you know. To check it out so that's cool i mean it's, it's really it's really well priced as well i mean you get a, i think it's you get a month free trial or maybe it's a week i can't remember off the top of my head um and um, i'm not sure of the pricing in the us i think it's four dollars 99 a month so it's you know it's pretty it's a couple of cups of coffee yeah yeah and it looks like it's 4.99 here in the us yeah so yeah per um, month or that's 50 dollars a year yeah, you can get a yearly discount, so you get like two months free. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. So, do you guys have any uh, any titles that you you're planning to release that you'd like to highlight, or anything that you're is on the service now that you'd like to highlight? There's a lot of exciting stuff coming through. Um, mm -hmm. I can't name too many names of things that we haven't announced, unfortunately. Um, but um, yeah, lots of exciting things coming through. Uh, a new one which we all thought was great which has just launched on the service and is coming out very shortly on blu-ray um it's the stylist which is a yeah. great film and michael worked on that one um and then yeah um 
some UHD, going to see some UHD upgrades of things that we have released on Blu-ray previously. Um, mm. Some new to market uh, titles, which will also be featuring on UHD. Um, and just, yeah, I don't, is there anything that you're working on at the moment, Michael, that's pretty well, juicy? Well, I mean, I mean, as, as, as I said at the beginning, my, my kind of, my niche is, Ita is Italian cult cinema and, um, I'm working on quite a few um, really exciting titles on that front, including a couple of really juicy box sets. Um, I, I think I've mentioned already there's one that should be getting announced at the end of this month, and then there's you know there's there's more in the pipeline. So it's you know it's it's an exciting time to be a film fan. I think. Very good. Good. Well, thank you guys. Um, I, I'm really happy that you guys were were willing to do this and just talk about physical media and sort of what it means to release a disc um, from your point of view, because like I said, um, I've done a few videos where I've talked about why I enjoy physical media and the things about them that I like. And, you know, I usually, it's usually 50, 50 split. Some people agree with me, you know, the other half, they're like, oh, I'll just do streaming. Um, and so it's sort of nice to get a distributor's take um, yeah. on these things. So thank you guys so much. Um, this is Arrow Films. They're out of the UK. They're based in the UK, but they distribute in Europe. They also distribute here in the US. Um, so definitely check them out online um, and just look up Arrow Films. Uh, and what I will say is please go out and buy some 4K UHD disc uh, from them. Um, it'd be great if they saw a little bump from this home theater hobbyist interview. Um, <laughs> but uh, do you guys have anything else you want to say before we sign off here? Um, no, I don't think so. Just uh, thanks for having us. It's been you know, a pleasure to talk to you about something that's you know, kind of near and dear to, to our hearts. Yeah, it's, it's good to see we're not the only ones that are so passionate about, about shiny discs in, uh, in plastic boxes. No, no, you're not. You're not. Uh, I can say that, like I said, about 50% of the audience will, is, you know, like uh, I still buy discs and some people still stick to uh to blu-ray because they like 3d and stuff like that and i guess we didn't really talk about 3d but um yeah we, so we uh, haven't done one we haven't done one to date there's no, been okay. a couple, there's been a couple of contenders um but they just haven't worked out for whatever reason um okay. but um but yeah that's one of the things with uh with uhd one of the other things alongside region code and that got killed is um it's 3d isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, there's a pretty big market there's a you know if, I shouldn't say pretty big market, but there are a lot of people that still like 3D Blu-ray. Um, oh, so I mean, there, there are people that are really, really passionate about yes, it. Yes, yes. Personally, I personally always just gave me a headache. But, yeah, um, <laughs> but, um, but no, there, there are people that, you know, if, if given the choice between 4K Ultra HD and 3D, it'll be 3D every day of the week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, and I... I hate that currently we don't have a 4K format for it because, I mean, like you said, there are people that really, really enjoy it. Um, but it's good to hear that you guys at least have heard your customers um, and their request for 3D, uh, 3D Blu-ray, and maybe they'll see something in the future. But uh, but yeah, that's great. That's excellent. So again, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, I'll put some links in the description below so you guys can find out more of their titles and just purchase some of their stuff. Like I said, go out, purchase some 4K Blu-rays so that they'll continue to release 4K Blu-rays. But also if you're into just Blu-ray or you have Blu-ray, purchase that as well. Because again, this is Arrow Films. They do a lot of sci-fi, a lot of cult um, classics. They also do horror film, that kind of genre. So if you're into those things, definitely use those links in the description below. Thank you guys for watching. We'll talk to you next time.